I'm going to talk a little bit about the brain and uh, what I study is basically trying to understand how this piece of machinery, this three pound piece of matter creates all of our subjective experiences, our feelings of love, our feelings of anxiety, when we dream, everything you experience from the moment you wake up to you go back to a deep dreamless sleep. And uh, the brain is pretty fascinating. It's a pretty complex piece of matter. It's made up of neurons. We have about... Um, about 86 to 100 billion neurons. Each of them has about 1,000 to 10,000 connections or synapses, so there are about 100 trillion connections in the human brain, right? That's more connections than there are stars in the Milky Way. But it's a myth we only use 10% of our brain. We actually use all of it, but we're only consciously aware of very little bit of what's happening. Much of what's happening in the brain is happening unconsciously, outside of awareness, motivating your behavior, your decisions. You make up these post hoc explanations about why you do things all the time. That's not really usually related to the real reason. Um, and we're starting to study this in the lab. What's the neural basis of these unconscious processes? So we can do this by giving people subliminal stimuli, either presented very quickly or presented in a very subtle form so people claim not to consciously be aware of the stimuli yet it goes on to kind of motivate and, and prime their behavior. So here's an example. Uh, so raise your hand if you see the subliminal message here. <clears throat> A couple of you, okay. I know what you guys are thinking. Got it. Uh, so you can see here in the negative space down by the roots, it says S-E-X, you see, right? And you got the birds and the bees and the flowers are kind of loving towards each other, right? So now once you see it, you can't not see it, okay? If I show you this in a, an hour, it'll pop right back at you, right? So something changed in your brain. And, and basically the stimuli remained exactly the same, okay? The photons hitting your retina, being processed by the visual cortex in your brain remained constant. But what changed was your perception, and that's what we wanna track, the neural basis of your perception. What changed when you saw the word sex versus when you didn't? Um, and this information is getting into your brain all the time. Um, this is, for example, I came across this cover of Parents Magazine recently. I don't know if you guys came across this, right? <laughs> Parents Magazine, yeah. So this went to press. Yeah, it hits people at different times. It takes a while. Uh, yeah, nobody, nobody noticed this. I don't know what was going on there. Um, <clears throat> But again, it will prime your behavior, you know, like maybe, you know, I don't know. There was, I don't know what exactly this was, message this was sending, but not, maybe it was the sexy sons, I don't, yeah. Um, so this is another example. So we give people, for example, this is a um, test where you either very quickly show people either the image of the bad boy throwing the cake or an image of the good boy, boy uh, presenting the cake, and people claim not to see anything. Then they show them superliminally or consciously this neutral image of a boy, and they ask people to just simply describe him with adjectives. Sure enough, if they saw subliminally the bad boy throwing the cake, they're much more likely to describe him with negative attributes than if they saw the good boy subliminally. Um, and there's a whole, there's hundreds of studies which show uh, the factors that were that factors we're unaware of influence our behavior and for, uh, for example even in the olfactory realm if they put a faint sort of lemon cleaner in the room smell nobody claims to consciously notice it but if they do that people are much more likely to clean up their crumbs after they're given cookies after a task for example or if there's a briefcase in the room people are more likely to act more competitively um, even if judges are more likely to deny people parole if they've gone for a long time without having a break. So there's all these subtle things and cues in our environment, again, which are dictating our behavior. And the same thing goes for choosing a mate. There's a lot going on outside of your awareness. Um, I just wanted to give you guys another example of a subliminal uh, message. So raise your hand if you can see this subliminal message here. Oh, okay, a bunch of people. Oh, great, good. Okay, so you guys, um, you all see the nine dolphins in the negative space here, <laughs> right? Yeah, so this is another interesting one. So prepubescent people, they see the nine dolphins right away, right? Post-puberty, they see the naked man embracing the naked woman. Um, and so again, what you perceive, it's context dependent. The stimulus is exactly the same, but your perception is, is different. And so we're starting to track the neural basis of this perception. Um, <clears throat> there's this one theory, um, it's called the neuronal workspace model, but basically what this says is, so this is the human brain, this is like the front of the brain, this is where your eyeballs would be. Um, and when you're processing visual information outside of awareness, it activates the primary visual cortex right here in the back of the brain. As the, the stimuli comes more into conscious awareness, you start to activate the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, and you get these feedback loops to the back of the brain, and that's when you get this conscious perception, that's when it comes up into consciousness. 
The other thing is that what correlates with conscious perception are these coalitions of neurons that start firing together. You can think of it like our Darwinian competition between groups of neurons in the brain. And when one coalition wins, it comes into power. That's what comes into consciousness. It stays there a few seconds. Uh, if you tend to something, it stays there longer until the next sort of coalition comes into power. And I liken it to a Twitter feed. So if each tweet is like a neuron firing, if enough people tweet about something, it starts to trend, right? And that's sort of trending in our, in our global social consciousness. The same thing of what happens in the brain. And what brings these neurons together, they're not all firing at the same time, um, but they're firing in coordination, in sync. So you can think of it like a sort of wave moving through a crowd. If each person is a neuron, they're not all standing up or sitting down at the same time. That would be like an epileptic seizure, right? But they're not all doing it randomly, but in coordination, in sync. Um, the other thing is there are basically these two systems in the brain. You have these areas in red, these subcortical areas. They're evolutionarily older. You can think of it like your, your, um, it's sensitive to immediate reward and pleasure, like your id impulses. I want that piece of chocolate cake right now, or you know, I want to have sex with that person right now. But then you have the more recently evolved prefrontal cortex, these areas here in blue. It's like the brake system of the brain. Thinks about the future consequences of your actions. So you know, maybe I want to have sex with that person right now, but you know what? I'm not going to like you know rape them. That wouldn't be appropriate so you know I'll hold back on that and you know maybe I'll court them a little bit first but if you have damage to the prefrontal cortex to this brake system that's when people have problems controlling their impulses um, and so there's this famous case of Phineas Gage where a, a, a metal tamping iron you know you all learned about this in like psych 101 went through his prefrontal cortex and completely changed his personality right he became impulsive and aggressive um, they even have studies if you even simply imagine an, uh, um, sort of losing control or aggressive scenario you actually get decreased activation in that brain system there and in a more recent case a man in his 40s developed pedophilia and he was about to be sentenced from molestation the night before he started getting headaches went into the hospital they found a big tumor right here in his prefrontal cortex uh they removed the tumor the symptoms went away he was allowed to return home symptoms came back a year later sure enough the tumor had gone back so you know again this is getting just simply from correlation you know showing that this part of the brain lights up when you do this to actually causation changes in the brain changing our behavior and in, in a study that, that I did, I actually looked at people with a psychiatric condition called borderline personality disorder, right? This is where they have, they, they're impulsive, they have um, unstable self-image, un instability in their relationships, in their, and they have emotional instability. And I found that actually a lot of their impulsive behavior is driven by problems they have in, in activation of their prefrontal cortex. So again, it's tied to problems in the brain. And okay, it's not all hopeless. So a lot of these conditions are amenable to therapy. Um, so we are malleable and changing our behaviors and thoughts can change the brain and ultimately change who we are to an extent within the kind of boundaries of our you know genes. Um, so although there's a lot going on that we don't have control of, there are still some things, we, we still have some control over our behavior. Um, but back to the sort of dating aspect. So when we're dating and choosing a partner, what's going on, right? As I said, a lot of what's happening is happening unconsciously and we're not aware of it, particularly in the realm of olfaction. So this is actually, I've done some research in olfaction. This is a study I didn't conduct, but it's a pretty well-known study where they had people wear these like t-shirts at night and they like collected sweat. And then they had, people go in and smell these different t-shirts of other people, right, of the opposite sex. And what they, they were asked to just say like, which, who they were attracted to in terms of the smell. And what they found was that people were attracted to other people. They chose t-shirts with people who had, when they looked at their genes, had compatible genes to sort of, um, their immune system, their immune systems were compatible so that ideally they would have children that would be better, more fit, right? So you, can't, you choose people based on smell, based on who you'd be sort of more genetically compatible with in terms of having offspring who are more likely to survive. But when women were on the pill, they actually chose the opposite. They made the wrong choices. They chose people that had immune systems that, or genetic code for their immune system that was more similar to them. Because when you're on the pill, it kind of tricks your body to think you're pregnant. And when you're pregnant, you, it makes more sense to be next to kin, right? And relatives, people are gonna help you out. Um, so, you know, be careful who you choose when you're on the pill because <laughs> <laughs> it might be, you might be making the wrong decisions. Um, and, 
I sort of extended some of this research. I built this old factometer where we can distribute scents to people while they're in the scanner and look at what happens to their brain when they're smelling different things. And we did this with people with obsessive compulsive disorder and actually found that when we gave them pleasant scents or unpleasant scents, in both cases, they had activation of a part of the brain called the insula cortex, which has to do with our sense of disgust. Um, and so they were actually experiencing, compared to healthy people, everything as much more disgusting, even odors, and that might lead to the more obsessive behaviors like then washing their hands and trying to cleanse themselves. So it might be a primary sensory processing deficit. Again, that we're all just, it's happening, we're not aware of it, right? And then it leads to these other behavioral problems. Um, the last thing I just wanted to, to kind of mention is that now that we're understanding how the brain works, um, it allows us to influence it in more direct ways. So I want to give you just a little taste of what's achievable with these brain-computer interfaces that we're developing. And one of these neural prosthetics that we're using now is called deep brain stimulation. We're actually going in and implanting electrodes in people's brains to treat, well, first it was used to treat movement disorders like Parkinson's, and now we're using it to treat psychiatric conditions like obsessive compulsive disorder and depression, where nothing else worked, right? They've tried all psychotherapy, drugs, even electric shock therapy. Um, and it's pretty amazing. We go in, these are what the electrodes look like. These are what they look like when they're planted in the brain. They're connected to a battery pack that's implanted in the chest wall. We can control it with a remote control. We can turn it up, we can turn it down. Uh, it's pretty pretty amazing. And, and this is actually a patient in the operating room. You turn on the electrodes, she doesn't know it, and her whole face lights up, and, and she says she feels happy. Then if you, you turn them off without her knowing it, all of a sudden she goes right back down to a flat affect. It's really amazing when you see this. So. Again, we're going from correlation to causation, going directly stimulating the brain to manipulate emotions. So you should be nice to neuroscientists. Um, and, and these are just the Model T forward of kind of what's to come. Um, as our understanding of the brain increases, so will our ability to not only treat disorders, but design cognitive uh, enhancements, things that can improve, say, like the processing speed in your brain, your memory capacity, um, modulate your emotions, uh, even decrease your need for sleep. Um, of course, there's ethical considerations, right? Like who can afford to get the implants? Will there be like two sets of people? Will there be like enhanced and unenhanced? enhanced. Um, what if someone can hack into your brain and, you know, control your behaviors? It's not, I mean, this is like within our lifetime that this stuff is going to be happening. And, uh, and finally, what does that mean for free will, right? So how much, how much free will do we really have, right? You know, you choose the blue pill. So strong free will implies that, let's say, Neo in the Matrix could have chosen, chosen the blue pill and lived in ignorance, even though his desires, his fears, everything in his brain was exactly the same. Um, so basically what Cartesian free will says is that if everything in the environment, everything in your brain was exactly the same, you could have chosen otherwise. Well, neuroscience, we don't believe in this. We think free will is an illusion in terms of that sense. And there's this famous ex experiment by Benjamin Libet where they say, they look at brain activation and they say, press a button whenever you feel like it, just whenever you feel. And they look at the brain activation and what they find is that when the person will say exactly when they felt like moving, they'll say where that ball was on that clock. And what they find is that when the person is aware of their intention, there's actually a buildup of brain activation about 350 milliseconds before they're even aware of their intention. So the brain is deciding first. And this led to this whole idea that free will is an illusion. There's a bunch of books you can read on that that has a lot of research in this area. Then one person said, wait, what about free won't? You know, maybe in this brief period when we have the intention before we actually do the action, we can stop ourselves. Well, that sounded good for a bit, but then they did another experiment and found that even the inhibition, you see a precursor to brain activation to inhibit as well. So basically, you're screwed either way. So <laughs> there is no free will, but there's maybe unconscious free will. And finally, what does that mean? Well, they, the studies show that if I tell you there's no free will, you're more likely to act unethically. And you know, like, oh, if I have no free will, what does it matter? But we do, you know, we do have, we have evolved the capacity to have self-control. And so we hold people responsible for their actions to, to the extent that they have the capacity to have self-control. That's why, for example, the prefrontal cortex, that, that break system, isn't fully developed in, until about the age of 25. That's why there are different judicial consequences um, for different ages, right? If you're five, you commit a crime. Well, you don't have the same capacity to have self-control as somebody who is maybe 30. So there's different consequences. And there's also individual differences, right? So you know this marshmallow test? You can either have one marshmallow now or you know, wait and have two. Well, this one test, they found, they tested all these different things. This one test was the best predictor of future life success in all areas, in job attainment, marriage, like, you know, even your you know, BMI, your body mass index, every, like, everything was based on this test. So the, what that test really is, is a measure of prefrontal cortex um, activation. You know, how much can you control your impulses? 
And so, I mean, the more I learn about the brain, the more I'm just in awe of it. And, um, you know, we still don't know a lot. We still don't have a fundamental theory of consciousness. Um, but what can we do with what we know? Well, I think one thing that we can gain sort of insight into is the idea that if we can get a better grasp of our un unconscious motivations, our desires, our fears, if we can look inward, right, like know thyself and kind of bring those things to the surface, that's kind of what psychotherapy tries to do, then we can maybe live more in line with our underlying goals and live more sort of in sync with ourselves. And we know our predilections, we can kind of work around them. And I think ultimately this will lead to, to more happiness and, fun and, un and really wisdom, right, which is I think experience and knowledge and good judgment. So even though we don't have complete control you know, we can get a better grasp of ourselves and, and live to our full potential. So that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Woo!